we're going to uh, just sort of formally dedicate this school year and our teachers and staff uh, to the Lord. So it's teachers and staff, and then there's a luncheon afterwards that uh, we have for them. We're glad that they're here with us today. They have a very important task throughout the year. It's sort of the front lines right here, right? They're the ones that deal with the kids every day, day in, day out, for several hours a day. And so we want to lift them up in prayer because their, their task is more than the task of just a, a public school teacher teaching arithmetic or math, well, math and arithmetic, teaching spelling or English or history or science. It's also helping them to understand the teachings of the Word of God, which are eternal in nature and have the ability to transform, transform the lives of the children that are here daily in a way that education in itself cannot do, right? We've all seen the failure of education uh, to create a moral people. Um, I grew up in, at a time when most of you grew up, a time in the past when, when it seemed like the values of our culture were a little different than the values of today. And yet I would say people are just as well educated, if not more highly educated, than at that time. But has it reformed the character of our people to such an extent that you would say society is better because of it? We may have more technology, but I don't think we're a more moral people. In fact, we're embracing a form of morality now that we, most of us when we were young would have never thought would have happened. And so education in and of itself is not the answer. I'm not saying it's bad, it's good, but it's not the answer. The scriptures are the answer. And we have the opportunity through these people up here on a daily basis to help the young people to learn the scriptures, to live the scriptures, and to see the scriptures lived out in their lives. And so I'm going to let them introduce themselves and what they do here at Grace real quick, and then we'll have a word of prayer for them. So why don't we start over here with Tom at the very end? Tom, where are we? Jeff Schmidt, Nat. Elizabeth Ledwick, fifth grade. Darlene Royster, kindergarten. Celeste Cochran, art. Wilma Pratt, principal. Marcus Rodriguez, Bible! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Amy Newagam in history. So, oh, I, I should have had you announce how many years you've been here, too, because some of these folks have been here for a long time. But um, I think Darlene holds the, uh, holds the record. Well, Glenn, Glenn holds the record, I guess. Uh, Darlene's second, you said how many years? Starting my 22nd year. Starting her 22nd year. Thank you. So, yes, thank you, Darlene. <clears throat> thank you and as of this month, this is my 41st year here. I came in August of 82. So, been a, most of my life, I think so. Although I'm only, well, you already know how old I am. <laughs> So I, I would like to ask maybe one of our elders, right where you're at, to stand and lead us in prayer, and, and then I will close us in prayer for this school year, for our teachers, for our staff, uh, for the children who will be here. So um, Harry, could I ask you to stand and start us off in a word of prayer? Would you join us as a congregation in our prayers, please? Father, we thank you for this. It's a new beginning for a school year, but it's also a history, a tradition of grace and the teachers and the janitorial service, the, the office, uh, pastoral. Father, we, we thank you for this uh, endeavor that you gave us of your ministry to children. So we just pray, Father, for each teacher, each worker, each child, um, even parents of children, that we might be a good influence, that there might be much learned that would be honoring to you that uh, your principles would be pointed out, carried out in each subject matter. Father, that you would add your blessing tremendously to each one and to each effort. So, Father, uh, this is your ministry. We thank you that we're a part of it. We ask your blessing on it. We're thrilled to have been able to do this and to do this. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you. The Father in heaven, we thank you for each and every person that's on the staff, those here and those that are not here today, several of them are involved in their own churches in such a way that they couldn't be here. 
And so we pray, Lord, that you would uh, just bless the teachers this year, help them in their task, uh, give them wisdom, uh, give them patience with the students, uh, help the students to be open to the, the teacher's instruction, especially when it comes to the Word of God. We, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work even now in the, the lives of every young person that will be here, uh, that they might have open hearts to the gospel and to the teachings of the Word of God. Father, we pray that you would keep everybody safe. We pray that you would keep us healthy. Uh, we pray that we'd be able to keep the proper mindset, uh, to, uh, the goal of helping each person, whether young or old, to become perfect in Christ, to know him in an intimate way. Not only to understand that they have a home in heaven, uh, but to understand that, that the Lord wants them to live for him and to spend the rest of their days doing that. And so, Father, help us. Help us to communicate that to these young people that will be here. We pray again that um, as the teachers continue throughout the year, that you give them stamina, that you uh, give them endurance, and uh, that you just be with them in a special way throughout the year. We thank you for them, for each and every one of them, and for each and every staff member. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Again, we have a luncheon for you afterwards. It'll be down that hallway uh, at the, uh, right at the very end of that hallway, there'll be uh, a luncheon for you immediately following the service. Well, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'd like you to open them to Psalm 119. What I'll be talking about this morning isn't really anything new, probably for most of you. If you've been studying the scriptures for any time, you should be familiar with the things that we talk about. But I want to remind you of those things. You know, the Apostle Paul said it in a couple different places in the New Testament to the churches that he addressed in his epistles that he wanted to remind them of these things. And, and so this morning, that is a part of my purpose with my message this morning, is to simply remind us of these things. I want to talk about what is the absolute essential to a Christian education. Why do we invest so much time, effort, and money on children's ministry? We have here at Grace, Grace Christian School, and we have had Grace since 1979, and a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a, a lot of money has gone into uh, the school, a lot of work. Um, in the early years, we had no maintenance man. Our deacons did all of the repairs here uh, for decades and uh, many of them would come in on a regular basis throughout the week, painting and fixing and doing things. Uh, we have school committee members that meet sometimes two to three times a week, normally, hopefully, only once a month. But during interviews, when we're interviewing prospective teachers or staff members, they have to come. Uh, all of our parents are interviewed. All of our new parents are interviewed. And so these are volunteers from the church that come in and, and spend much of their time helping out here with the school ministry. But we not only have Grace Christian School, we have Tuesday Night Kids Club, we have Wednesday Night Teens, we have Sunday School, we have Vacation Bible School. And so we have all of these ministries to children and some question, why? Why spend so much time, so much effort, so much money in reaching children? And I think a simple answer is this. It's because we understand how the Word of God can change the life and direction of a child. Those of us who ex have experienced the saving grace of Jesus Christ, those of us who know him as our Savior and know the teachings of his word, know how much of a difference Christ makes in our lives. And we want to see that for our children. I wish, I was raised in a, what I would call a nominal Christian home, a family that went to church, but whose parents did not know the Lord as their Savior. Now, I, my, mom, my mom questions that. She wonders sometimes if she knew the Lord or not. Uh, but the only time she went to church as a child herself was on her own. She was in a family of 13 kids, and basically she had to get a ride from the neighbor if she wanted to go to church. Her dad had had three strokes by the time he was 55 years of old, 55 years of age, and um, was pretty much disabled. Uh, they were a poor for farm family in, in uh, western New York, and so if she wanted to go to church, she had to do it on her own and find somebody to take her. And so consequently, she didn't go that often. And my dad almost never went to church. And so we weren't raised in a Christian home. And we, as we grew up, many of us adopted some of the values of this world as teenagers and got involved in things we shouldn't have gotten involved in. And sometimes brought 
um, hurt and pain uh, into our family. And I look back on those things and I think to myself, boy, what would it have been like had I been raised in a Christian home? Now, I know God had reasons and purposes for why we were raised where we were raised. I had loving parents. You know, I had the advantage of loving parents. Some kids that are raised even in Christian homes don't have loving parents. I had parents that stuck together through thick and thin uh, their entire lives. Right? My mom's still alive, but, you know, my dad's dead. But they stayed together and worked through problems. And some people don't have that advantage either. But I often wonder how much of a difference would the Word of God have made in my life when I was young? Because I know how much of a difference it made in my life after I dedicated my life to the Lord. And so those of us who, who realize the difference that the Word of God can make in our lives realize how important it is then for young people to avoid the pitfalls of life, the dangers of life, the temptations of life through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit and the teachings of the Word of God. We want children to be able to avoid sin and live successfully for God. We want them to be honest, dependable, helpful, productive, loving members of society. We want them to be able to avoid the scams and schemers of evil people. And for many of us, we want them to be better than ourselves, right? I know with my children and with my grandchildren, I hope that they turn out better than I did. <laughs> so um, I think that's a desire of many of us, that our kids will actually be better individuals even than ourselves. So what can we do to help young people become lovers of God more than lovers of money or more than lovers of pleasure or the things of this world? What can we do to help them to care about their fellow human beings and treat all people with dignity and respect? What is the absolute essential to helping to bring this about, to bring about a life of godliness in an individual? Well, I think Psalm 119 answers that for us. Now, you see on, on the overhead in front of you, you see some passages that are sort of the theme for this morning, but they're not the main text, even though the main text comes from Psalm 119. It says in Psalm 119.9, how can a young man cleanse his way? And some, I may revert back to the King James Version. You know, I grew up with the King James, and I memorized in the King James. I prefer the New American Standard. I like the NIV, but I've memorized everything in the King James. So if you hear the wording slightly different, realize that's why. But it says, how shall a young man cleanse his way? And then it goes on to answer that. It says, by taking heed thereto according to thy word, or by living according to his word. And then in verse 11, it says, You're, uh, in the King James, it says, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And really, that's the key then, right? God says the way to overcome sin, the way to be victorious in life and our battle against those things that oppose God is to know the word of God. The word of God is the absolute essential to living a life that is pleasing to God. And let me just add to that, that's not just for children. That's for all of us, children and adults alike. And so now let's move to the main text, Psalm 119, verses 97 through 104, if you have your Bibles and you're following along. There in verse 97, it says, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my tastes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, as we look into your holy word now this morning, I pray that you would just speak to our hearts and remind us of those things that maybe most of us already know. The centrality and importance, the essential nature of your word to the life of your creatures, to humanity, to those that you desire to not only know you in a personal, intimate, saving way, but to live for you as well. And so, Father, help us to remember these things and help us to remember that we have a responsibility to the younger generation to help them know these things and experience them for themselves. We ask your, your help in reminding us of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
John Milton, a 17th century English poet best known for his epic poem, Paradise Lost, was also a servant under Oliver Cromwell and a staunch defender of free speech and freedom of the press back in the 17th 17th century, in the 1600s, when those ideas were not always practiced by governments. Milton wrote this about the purpose of education. Listen to what he says. He says that the end of education is to repair the ruin of our first parents, that is Adam and Eve, by regaining to know God aright, and out of that knowledge to love him, to imitate him, and to be like him. This was said by a man who could read and write fluently in English, Latin, Greek, and Italian. And I think he nails it. He nails it. The goal of education then, or the end of education, is to repair the ruin of our parents. We're all familiar with Adam and Eve and the fact that they fell into sin and that they then affected the whole human race because of their sin. And all of us to this very day have been marred by sin, right? We're all impacted by sin. My body's been impacted by sin. That's why it's dying. I hope to reach 90, but <laughs> the Bible says three score and 10, right? You, you've got, uh, well, that's not even a promise, but our bodies are aging. They're wearing out. There's disease. There's illness. Why? Because the Bible says because of sin. It affects our body, but it also affects our mind. Our minds have been affected by sin. They've been corrupted by sin. And so we think evil thoughts. We think things that we should not think. And, and we experience that probably pretty much every day of our lives. Even in our redeemed state, we experience the corruption of sin, right? Uh, I, I can just illustrate that by saying how many of you as Christians have driven down the road, have somebody cut you off or do something that you weren't very happy about, and you think an evil thought about that driver. Now, you may not even know why he did what he did, but isn't it easy for us to think bad thoughts about others? And that simply illustrates... The fact that our minds, as well as our bodies, have been corrupted by sin. And both are in need of redemption. Our entire being is in need of redemption, which only comes, according to the scriptures, through the saving grace of Jesus Christ. But what we see as well is that not only does the, the, the teachings of the word of God lead us to salvation in Christ, but we also see that there are many other benefits, many of them practical benefits, for those who learn the scriptures. Looking at verse 97, Psalm 119, verse 97. First of all, we see the phrase, I love your law. And what you'll note as you go through Psalm 119 is that there's synonym after synonym after synonym after cinnamon, not cinnamon, I'm thinking McDonald's cinnamon buns. Wow. Synonym for the word of God, right? Here in verse 97, it's called his law. In verse um, 98, his commands. In verse 99, statutes. In verse 100, precepts. In verse 101, word. In verse 102, laws again. In verse 103, his words. In verse 104, precepts. And on and on it goes through Psalm 119. And they're just simply different aspects of the word of God. And so over and over again, what we see here is the psalmist declaring the benefits of knowing the word of God. And what are those benefits? And by the way, it's not, it's not just simply reading it as a casual reading. Sometimes that's all we do with the word, right? We pick it up in the morning, we spend our five minutes with our coffee and the Bible, and we're done for the day. And, and we really don't go much deeper than that, and I would suggest that that's not enough for most of us. Here the psalmist says he meditated on it all day long. He thought over it and over it and over it and over it. Sort of think of it like, uh, like some, a problem in your life that just haunts you, right? Have you ever stayed up at night because you can't sleep because you're thinking about a problem? And it goes over and over and over and over again in your mind. Well, if, if we could just replace that with the positive thoughts of Scripture, where we're thinking about the Scriptures over and over and over and over again and letting them influence our lives, that's the idea of meditation, of meditating on it all day long. And so, again, what are the benefits? He goes on to say that it makes, makes me, he says, but I would suggest anyone who does that, wiser than their enemies. For the teachings of God are with him. It goes on and says it gives them more insight or gives him more insight than all my teachers. Now, that's, that's the favorite verse of some of our students. Right? We, I think every teacher here at Grace at one time or another has had one of the students cite that verse 
Lucky the Bible says that I, I can have more insight than you. And actually, that's a potential reality, isn't it? If, if a, a young person or old person, regardless of age, spends their time meditating on the Word of God, it might be possible for them to have more insight than their teachers, depending on what their teachers do with the Word of God. In verse 100, it says, I have more understanding than the elders. And that's not the elders of the church. This is the Old Testament that we're looking at here. It's the elders of society. It's those people that sat in the city gates that would make judicial decisions concerning the community where they were elders. It was the leaders of their society. And here the psalmist says, I have more understanding than the elders. But why does he have more understanding than the elders? Because he says, I obey your precepts. So again, it's the word that helps him to have more insight than his, his teachers. It's the word that makes him wiser than his enemies. It's the word that gives him more understanding than the elders. In verse 101, it says, I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. Uh, how many of us would, would love for our children to avoid every evil path? Our grandchildren. Uh, how many of you have um, grandchildren? That you're here this morning, you have grandchildren. How many have great grandchildren? Let's go here. Okay, several have great grandchildren. Yeah. So I'm I'm sort of new to the grandchildren thing, right? <laughs> but I know this. I have a, a a a very strong desire to see my grandchildren follow the Lord, to come to know Him as Savior, and to follow Him. <clears throat> and so we enjoy having them over the house. They they spent this a good part of the weekend at our house this weekend. And uh, I was cutting the grass and had little Isaiah on the riding mower and, and we're out there and I'm trying to teach him some things, right? Because I want him to start cutting my grass pretty soon. So, <laughs> <laughs> but so I'm trying to teach him to, you know, follow the, the line there. Okay, that's cut. That's not cut. You got to take the mower, overlap a little bit, but follow the, well, he's five years old, you know, what, what can you, <laughs> but he's having a blast thinking he's driving uh, the uh, lawnmower. And so I'm trying to do that for a couple laps. And then I thought, okay, now it's time. Let him have some fun. Right? Let him have some fun in the process. Because I want him to like his granddad. Not, that's not my primary goal. But I want him to enjoy being around me so that when we talk about the word of God, when we, when we try to teach him things about biblical principles, uh, that it, he'll listen. That it won't be, oh, that's it's my old mean grandfather who I never have any fun with and I don't want to listen to him. I want him to have a different attitude than that. So, so I just let him go. That's what he wanted to do with the lawnmower. So we're going around the backyard like a go-kart, right? on the lawnmower. This kid's only five years old. He has to stand there at the steering wheel. And he's a tiny, you, most of you know little Isaiah, but he's, he's so tiny, he has no strength. And, and, but he's learned to use his body weight. And so we're going along and he's got the steering wheel and he goes like this. And it's like, it's like a wrestler slamming the guy to the ground, you know. And then the, the mower goes, shoo, makes a, a, an L-shaped turn, you know, a 90 degree turn. And, and then he does it the other way. And so we're doing this in the backyard and people must driving by must have thought, that guy's crazy. Why is he cutting the grass like that? And I usually like to have nice lines in my yard. You know, when you cut your grass, do you like to leave nice lines in the yard? You know, it only lasts for a day or so until the grass. But my, my backyard looked like this, you know, after we were done. But he had fun. I'm concerned about my grandchild and them learning the word of God because of what I know the word of God can do for him and for my granddaughter. And for all of us, for the kids here at Grace, for the kids in our school, for the kids in our church, for your kids. And I hope, I hope that your concern is just as strong as my concern to see young people come to know the Lord because in part of the benefits here that the word of God can impart to these young people. I want them to avoid every evil path. I want them to avoid the sins that, that so often affect our young people and can cause disaster in their lives. You know, my, my son-in-law, most of you know, is a deputy, and he tells me how often they're dealing with, with people that are dying from drug overdoses. Most of those people aren't old people. Most of them are younger people. And, th and they don't start, most of them don't start out on heroin and fentanyl overnight. It's a process. They start with something, some sort of lesser drug, and then they move on, and then they get to the stronger drugs. And, be, and we've got young people all across this country. It's an epidemic that are dying from drugs. And it's, there's a strong temptation on the part of many of them to get involved, not with the idea. Nobody starts taking drugs thinking, oh, someday I'll die a junkie, right? Nobody thinks that. Nobody, nobody thinks, oh, someday I'll be an alcoholic when they start drinking, it happens. It happens over a period of time. It's something that most of them 
would like to reverse probably themselves, but they need a source of strength to overcome that. They need a source of strength to say no to their friends that are doing that kind of thing. And, and the only thing that I know that can do that is the word of God. I, I had friends when I was in high school. You know, marijuana was the big thing when I was in high school. It's still the big thing, I guess, because all my neighbors are smoking it. <laughs> I, don't, I, could, I walk outside and you can get high by smelling the air. It's, a, I, it's unbelievable, and I'm not joking. It's like... And, uh, but, you know, hard drugs were just coming on the scene. I, I didn't know anyone that did cocaine or anything like that. And, and I had some friends that eventually started to experiment with that. And, and I could see, I don't want to go down that road. I could, I, you know, in my own mind, I was, I don't know, no, want to go down that road. But I couldn't break off my friendship with them. And I, I don't know how I had the sense, but I had the sense to realize if I keep hanging around with these guys... I'm going to end up doing what they're doing, and that could be disastrous. I had a real good friend that died at the Newport Ritchie Rec Center at the age of 22, running down the basketball court in his aorta burst. He had been doing cocaine the night before, most of the night, and my understanding is it does something to the arteries. I don't know all the medical explanation. All I know is that my 22-year-old friend dropped dead, and he was almost instantly dead, blood just coming out of his mouth there on the, on the rec center floor. And, that, and I, I knew that will be me in a few years if I don't avoid what they're doing. But I didn't have the strength within me to avoid it. And, and so I went to Bible college to get out of Newport Ritchie. That's, that sounds true. My, my religious nut of a younger brother, some of you have heard my testimony. That's what we thought of him. He was a religious nut. He had gone crazy. He's studying the Bible at a Bible college. What are you going to do with that for the rest of your life? And he kept bugging us, you guys ought to come, you guys ought to come, you guys ought to come. And so I saw where my friends were going, but I did not have the internal strength to say no to what they were doing, and I knew I had to get out of there. And I went to Bible college to escape my friends in this area. And there I started learning the Word of God for the first time in my life. And as I learned the Word of God, I found a source of strength in the Word of God that enabled me when I came back that summer Rather than partying with my friends, three of my friends that I hung out with in high school came over to my house and said, hey, we're going to a party tonight. There's going to be booze. There's going to be drugs. There's going to be girls. You come in with us. And for a split second, for a split second, I was thinking, yeah, sounds like fun. And, and then the word came to my mind. And I started witnessing to my friends. These were my friends. This is the last time my friends ever invited me to anything, <laughs> which was good. They decided I had become a religious nut and that I had gone crazy and I never got invited to anything else again. But most of those people that I hung out with in high school ruined their lives, whether through alcohol or through drugs. And the only thing that kept me from that was the Word of God. And I understand how essential it is to overcoming sin, to, to being able to avoid, like he says here in 101, I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. That's what we want our young people to learn. We want them to learn to love the word of God so much and to love its teachings so much that they don't want to go down those evil paths. They don't want to ruin their lives. They don't want to get involved in that which would be displeasing to the Lord even if it doesn't ruin their lives, which most of the time sin Sin has repercussions. We reap what we sow, and it'll affect them. Verse 103 says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. 104, I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong way. Oh, that all of humanity would hate every wrong way. That all of humanity would hate to cheat their neighbor, to steal their identity, uh, to to rob, to harm, to hurt, to do things that, that aren't good for other people. I don't know if you've seen that recent movie, um, Sound of Freedom. I hope that you have. If you haven't, I would encourage everybody to see it about human trafficking. The evils that people can do with other human beings. It's astounding. Um, when I was over in Germany on one occasion, we went to um, uh, Dachau to visit the concentration camp there. And I remember David and I, when we were in Poland, wanted to go to Auschwitz. We didn't get to go, but... I remember going through Dachau and seeing the posters and the writings of what happened in that particular concentration camp. And even as an adult, I got sick to my stomach. As I read what humans did to other human beings, I got sick to my stomach. And I said to my wife, I said, I got to get out of here. I got to go outside. And, and I went outside and, and quit reading what was happening, what people were doing to people. Why, why and how can people do that to people? 
And I would suggest it's, it's the result of a depraved mind. It's the result of an unregenerate mind. It's the result of, of the lack of God's word in the hearts of individuals. And so we realize the significance, the essential nature of the word of God for our children. Psalm 119 verses 9 through 11 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? And it answers it by living according to your word. In verse 11 again, it says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them by thy truth. That is set them apart. Set them apart from us. Set them apart from sin and set them apart to God. Well, how is that done? He says, sanctify them by thy truth. He's praying to his father for the disciples. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. It is absolutely essential to living the kind of life that God wants us to live. And when a young person or an old person, when a child or an adult makes the word of God their meditation day and night, they become like the man described in Psalm chapter 1. There we read this. It says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, I know there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee. It's a proverb. Some people say that this is a promise of scripture. It's a, it's a truth. It's a general truth. That's what Proverbs are, right? Proverbs are general truths. But I can assure you of this, that if we don't train up our children in the way they should go, they're not going to go that way probably. They're going to go their own way. Or they're going to go the way of their friends. My, my parents didn't know what I was doing as a teenager, right? How many of you have, right? They, my mom got, you know, she... She was shocked several times as an adult when she would hear my stories. You know, after I finally got old enough, I know they couldn't, they couldn't punish me anymore, right? So they couldn't just... And, and so, but I can, I can guarantee you that by not training children, they will probably go in a direction you don't want them to go. And so our task is to train them in the way they should go. And what usually happens is they when they are old at least, do not depart from it. Sometimes they have rebellious years, right? There's a, how many stories have we heard of kids? And, and it's always the preacher's kid, but I like to suggest it's more often the deacon's kids. <laughs> but, but, you know, the, they, they go astray and they run wild for a while. But the promise is when they are old, when they are old, they will not turn from it. So whose responsibility is it to help them to learn the scriptures? Well, I believe primarily it's the responsibility of parents. That's what the scriptures teach. Right from the very beginning, when God chose Abraham, he says something about the reason he chose him in Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. And here's what he says. The father of the Jewish race through which the Messiah came. God says, for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. God said, I chose Abraham in part so that he will communicate my truth to the following generations. And then we see the same with Moses. Later on, after the children of Israel had multiplied in Egypt and and then finally were uh, uh, released by Pharaoh and they're wandering in the wilderness and we see the law given to them. And in the law, God says this in Deuteronomy chapter 6, which is a part of the great Shema, that command to ancient Israel He says this, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts and press them on your children and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. And so we see it with Abraham. We see it with Moses. We see it with the psalmist in Psalm 78. Verses 5 through 7, that parents have the primary responsibility of communicating the word of God to their children. 
Psalm 78 verse 5 says, He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commandments. And so we see it with Abraham. We see it with Moses. We see it with the psalmist. But then we see it in the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And so the primary responsibility for teaching our children the word of God is with parents. But the church can assist with that. And I would like to suggest the school can, if it's a Christian school, where the Word of God holds an important role in the life of that school. In fact, we often talk about a, three, a three-legged stool here at Grace, and, and how that if you have that three-legged stool, it's much easier for us to accomplish what we want to accomplish. And that is the church, the school, and the home. If the church, the school, and the home are all trying to accomplish the same objectives in the life of children, I think we will be much more likely to succeed in what we're trying to accomplish than if it's only the home and we send our our kids away to a place where they, they don't learn the word or where they learn opposite values of the word. And so the church, the home, and the school must work together in order to help us to be successful. And that's that's the reason why we invest so much time, so much energy, so much money in having a Christian school. Now, the neat thing is today, there's something possible that wasn't possible decades ago. Most children can go to school here uh, on scholarships. In the state of Florida, we we have uh, scholarships available where um, you you can make a fairly decent amount of money and and still qualify. And so many many of our parents here have their kids here on scholarship. That isn't possible in every state. I praise the Lord for that. I also realize the danger of that. And so I'm going to ask a prayer from you. All it takes is one change in our government, either at the federal level or the state level, and a change in the, in the civil rights legislation and wording where they change um, the word sex to gender identity and sexual orientation. If that changes, whether it changes at the state level or at the federal level, then we have to accommodate that in order to receive scholarship funds. That could close our school down overnight if we didn't become eligible for those funds anymore because right now I think we only have about 12 paying families. All the rest are on scholarship. We, we got about 180 some kids enrolled in school here. It was up to 191. I don't have the final statistics, but it's in the 180s. Most of them on scholarship. And so pray. Pray that, you know, with the elections, whoever is governor of the state of Florida, they will fight to maintain the present day wording, which has been there for years and years and years, all the way back to the 1960s, that our civil, our federal government will keep the same, same wording in all of that civil legis- legislation, which contains that wording, and uh, that, that parents will still then, even poorer parents, but they, you don't have to be poor anymore, right? 110,000, family of four, you can get a scholarship. It amazes me. And and what an opportunity, uh, what a privilege that we have here in the state of Florida to be able to participate in that. And so I I solicit your prayers that we'll be able to keep that the way that it is. I I trust God, if, if if it changes, he'll have a reason for it, right? But in the meantime, it seems to us advantageous for our parents to be able to receive those funds. So we as parents have an awesome responsibility, an awesome task. I was going to read the story of Eli, but I'll just mention it. Read it. Eli was a priest of ancient Israel, pretty good priest for most of his life. But he had two sons that were wicked sons, and he failed to correct them. He failed to remove them from the priesthood. And as a result, God says, there'll never be an old man in your family again. It illustrates us the awesome responsibility that we have as parents, sometimes even as adult parents of adult children, to warn them of the course of their actions according to the teachings of God's words, but hopefully to instruct them before the warnings needed, and hopefully they will learn to love the Lord and obey him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this morning as we get ready for communion, close out our service with it. 
that we re-realize how gracious you have been to us in providing your son Jesus Christ as the sacrifice for our sins, the one who died in our place, who bore the penalty of our sins, who rose again so that we could have not only the forgiveness of sins, but a victorious life in the here and now, the strength to overcome temptation and sin in our lives through the indwelling power of your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we pray that this year would be a wonderful year of people either coming to know you or giving their lives to you. The children in our school, their parents if they don't know you, and all of us as adults. And so, Father, we just, we just pray uh, that your Holy Spirit would be powerfully at work here uh, through the various ministries of grace, especially those with the children and our school. We ask your help in this. Father, uh, uh, we have been negligent in our duties as parents, as grandparents, aunts and uncles, or just the examples as church members. Forgive us. Help us to do better. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.